let me sort of try and remix that statement in a more sort of more accurate way. Say, kids, what time is it? I, eclecticism. Yeah. You know, John and I are children of John Peel, taking the New York influence of people like Grandmaster Flash and Double D and Steinsky. It's like, okay, well, here's a way that we can actually combine all these different sorts of music and make music out of it by DJing, remixing, sampling, production, having a good time collaging with sound. So those were the two things that I think are a big part of that route, that eclectic route. This is a journey into sound. Smart guy called Julian Palmer who worked as NR for Fourth and Broadway in London, and he was aware of us because of our little singles we put out. And he, we were third, I think, on his list to remix it. The first two turned them down. I'm not sure they were. So he said, "Look, you know, do you fancy yeah. doing this?" We were like, "Yeah, for sure." It was a chance to work with a major US hip hop artist. We got paid 700 quid. We did a version called "Not Paid Enough" eventually because it sold 11 million. Um, <laughs> And uh, and uh, the rest is history. So that was a good that was a good mix. And all credit to John, as I say, I used to do a lot of the early tracks, but it was John that uh, found Offer Hazar. That sample was John's contribution, probably our most notorious sample ever. So um, hats off to John for that. And I think he was turned on to that by the late Charlie Gillette, who was someone who a DJ who a, a champion of world music and opened many, many heads, I think. Got us on the cover of the NME. So that was like, hey, you know, we're doing it. Um, Zen Bones, isn't it? That came out of, you know, we've, you've probably heard the story that Bogus Order, DJ Food and the whole Ninja Tune identity were basically attempts by John and me to escape from the sticky clutches of the Babylon record business, which we would got caught in like a fly in a sticky web and we wanted to buzz off so Ninja Tune was our sort of technicolored escape pod to get out of that and um, so we thought even before that though we had flirted with aliases and we'd noticed how artists from America particularly the house artists used to have a lot of different aliases and as we like making up names and stupid titles Bunny and uh, God and the Prophets and um, DJ Food, etc., etc., and Bogus Order. We thought it was fun to have lots of aliases. And so Bogus Order sort of slept for then, you know, 25 years or so until. Long story short, um, John's and my role as founders of the label, and then as the label's grown into such a big thing, uh, far more than we ever dreamt, really. It hasn't always been that easy in a relationship. You might think, oh, well, we own the label. We just tell everyone what to do. Our records get the top priority, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Not, I mean, the main man at the label is Peter Quick, and we brought him in. He was a friend of a friend, phoned up one day, said he wanted to work for a small label. He came down and he's been here ever since for the last 26, seven years. And he is a great guy. And you know, many artists will say the ideal thing that they want is to find someone who can handle the business side of it. And we were lucky to find that with Pete, who gets his creative kicks and and um, satisfaction from running the label, which he does in a very much respected and, and loved way, actually. Um, he's got a reputation as the nice guy of the music. Uh, I, I would, would say it's like a family relationship. It's all very well when it's just you, but when once you start involving other people, that's when things get complicated with a partner or even more with a family, even more with a big family. With Ninja Tune, it's the right old tribe now. So um, it's to balance that all up and put our priorities against the priorities of the label and of course all the other artists that we have on the label now. So we, John and I are not like sort of, you know, emperors who sit around stamping our feet and telling everyone what to do with, with great cracks of the whip and so on. It's not like that. We're, that's not our, been our way. It's been more of a sort of organic thing. And for oh, instance, nice. there was the there was the record the, the band played the boogie you know so that was another artist and actually was sort of that was the biggest single on ninja that that to date and that was a journalist who liked our music reviewed it and said you know this track ought to have a rap on so he said well have you got any suggestions so he went off and found this guy born to be and put this rap on it and um and then launched his own career went off very successfully to be us three who got to remix all the blue note catalog jeff wilkinson his name was i bumped into him a couple of years ago funny enough at Buddha Field festival and we compared notes on the last uh, 
25, 30 years. And again, it's typical with a label, or I think a typical story, some artists get inspired or young guys get inspired, people get inspired by what you're doing. They think I'll have a go at doing that. And then they end up becoming part of the family. But to go back to bogus order, my, my long winded sort of um, uh, circuitous explanation is that we, we decided that actually Ninja was formed to put out John's and my music. That was the raison d'etre of it. And that kind of got a bit lost along the way. And, you know, as I say, it became a much more complicated story. So we were like, well, actually, we're still here. We've got a lot of tracks which we want to put out. They don't all fit the cold cut name. Everything cold has got to, you know, be of a certain, that's our biggest identity, if you like. And that, that became a whole story in itself. Um, so we wanted an identity where we could release other types of music without perhaps so much scrutiny. Um, and that was partly why we were resurrected ahead of our time, not just uh, uh, Bogus Order, but the, the original identity ahead of our time, which was before Ninja Tune, which was again, John's and my playground to do whatever we wanted before Ninja became such a big deal. So that's the reason, the similar sort of reason for the, the rebirth of ahead of our time. Um, so most of those tracks there, Job were made by John actually over the last few years. A yeah. good example of how John sort of really mastered that craft. And uh, he brings, he used to make jewelry and he has a very sort of particular perfectionist way of doing things. And um, I'm a bit more sort of manic and wild and, uh, you know, um, too much all over the place sometimes. So that's part of how our dynamic works is sort of balancing each other like that. So I, as you've probably seen, I've been fascinated by the software and the multimedia. And the audio visual and the internet and uh, the sort of creative tech side of things. I, in a way, I've concentrated more on that over the last few years. Also, I've been concentrating on the activism, the environmentalism. It's an, it's an absolute motherfucker. It's, it looks the same, but it's like 10 times as powerful. So I've never been so near to i've got my ultimate instrument basically i built it with my crew and it's fucking amazing so i'm gonna I'm, i i look on with envy at people like richard james who's crafted this mysterious personality and never really let on about how he does anything and people just love it and people i think sometimes want to believe that these that there's a special kind of shaman music making class who people say i say have a go on ninja and they go oh no i could never do that and i'm I'm not a musician, I could never do that. It's like, all you've got to do is press some buttons. And I'm not saying that's all Richard James does all the time, because I think he's an absolute genius with his special craft. But you know, I've always not, I've never taken that attitude. My attitude is like, actually, this isn't that difficult. I have a lot of fun doing it. Why don't you have a go? This is how you can do that. And um, it's not so mysterious. Maybe it's not just such good marketing, but that's what I stand for is uh, fun and democratizing it, making it as available as possible to everyone. I think the world would be a better place if more people spent their time making music and less time fighting. Their Pixie is a sort of, I don't know if you've read the blurb, but it's like a small cut down player version of a much bigger thing, which is a kind of modular visual synthesizer. The most important thing is it's a fun way to fuck around with visuals and create stuff. I'm always, I don't get into holy wars. Their devoted following includes John Peel, who only this week chose one of their songs for his Desert Island Discs. Here they are in collaboration with Mixmaster's Cold Cut, The Fall. He, he was a character. I, I think that at that time we were into hip hop, we loved it, but there was no real British rap that sounded any cop. So to my mind, he was a sort of British rap that was authentically British, um, but yet had something of that kind of playfulness, fuck you attitude, um, originality that we felt in rap, but it wasn't about trying to rap and put on a fake American accent. And he seemed to do it in a different way. I, so I thought that it was 
quite an interesting mixture to get someone like that and put them on the electronic dance track. And I, I possibly observed that, you know, that predated the kind of UK indie dance thing. Of putting Marky e. Smith on a what was basically a an acid house track. Um, with psychedelic guitars sampled from Deep Purple, I think I can reveal that. Um, it, was, it was a decent, it was a provocative, decent mixture. And then so that led on to um, collaboration on Telephone Thing. And he was a, quite a hoot to be around. I remember Pete Lawrence, who I vaguely knew, coming up to me and saying, Matt, I'm too busy. I'm supposed to be DJing. I'm too busy. Can you DJ for a bit? So I was like, well, I've got some records in the car. So I went out, got my records. I stuck on... I think my first record was Music Creating Musician, Steve Reich, which is my favourite piece of music. It's nice and long, so it gives you a chance to skin up and consider your next move. And I stayed for the next, I think, 15 big chills, DJing and VJing. And uh, it was a really good party. And as regards Autumn Leaves, that was a song that my parents used to sing. Um, they, they weren't, they didn't, none, we didn't play musical instruments in my family. My sister played the piano, but we, the rest of the family just used to sing. And so we learned all these songs from mum and dad, like old jazz standards and uh, you know, Trouble in Mind and Sister Rosetta Tharp, you know, quite some black music actually. And then the Temperance Seven, who my dad was at college with, who were a bunch of clever, cool, white hipsters at art college at, you know, at the Royal College of Art in the 60s, um, who were totally inspired by 30s black music and decided they'd have a go themselves. George Martin produced the record, he was number one um, uh, 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 in the 60s and that still sounds really good. So I know all those songs as well. And Autumn Leaves, I don't know if I ever heard the original, but we used to sing it, so I, I knew it. So I thought it, it was a time when everything was being covered and all these, the Soul to Soul beat was in full effect. Massive Attack were just bursting onto the scene. We wanted to make a track like Unfinished Sympathy really, which I consider is probably the single best track of the entire movement for the last 30, 30 years or whatever. Um, and so I thought I'd dig a little bit further back because I, that Autumn Leaves is in fact a 50s song. In fact, it goes back to the 30s because it was originally a, a French poem, then set to music by Cosmo Probe and then translated into English and the extra verse added. So interesting how a song can morph like that. And then, um, yeah, we were on Arista at the time through like I say, being stuck somehow in the sticky web of the music business. And they were like, yeah, this is, sounds like a single. Let's put a house beat behind it. Like, my dead body. No, let's get Mixmaster Morris to, to uh, remix it. And uh, he worked his magic. Probably my favourite DJ, Mixmaster Morris. And I, uh, ambient music, it was, a, it was a, an oasis. It was a, it was a, a refuge from the thudgy like um, and sort of ecstasy and then coke fueled um, McDance that just dominated everything in the 90s. And so we were on a different tip and Mixed Master Morris led us to a, 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 another lush land and that was one of the soundtracks for that. Yeah. I'd like to get around to it because I listen to that sort of music with great enjoyment and I do experiment with stuff like that. Um, I think we need, to, actually, I've got an alias, a new alias. It's called Ndipa, N-D-I-P-A. And it stands for New Directions in Psychedelic Ambience. But uh, Ndipa is, I, I would like to release some, some purely ambient music. And that's a project which sooner or later, I'm going to get my finger out and, and get out there in one form or another. And, and can you tell me who your partner in crime is on that? Um, he is a guy called Darren Sangita. He's a very good friend of mine, in fact, I don't know if you know, but I had a pretty savage car crash last year, and I'm very lucky to be here. Yeah, well, me and my wife had a ma major car crash. And I mean, only six months ago, I, could, I couldn't walk down to the end of the road. I was, but I've made a really good recovery. And Darren, bless his heart, is a good friend of mine, and he came here and stayed with us for three weeks when we came out of hospital, just looking after us and cooking and nursing us, basically. And um, so I'm very grateful to him for that. But we also have a, we are quite, productive music creators and we're both into apps and he advises me with Ninja Jam and he's a, he has makes fantastic music. He's a real Indi Indophile. So he always goes to India every year and he's got all these amazing Indian musicians that he does kind of fusion music 
Um, and if you look up Sangeeta Sounds, S-A-N-G-I-T-A, Sangeeta Sounds, you'll find plenty of music by Darren under various aliases. And uh, if you like a bit of nice ambience and something else, you, you'll like that. So he, him and I have done some stuff together. This is a journey by a DJ. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value. value. And a new experience. With Journeys by DJ, you know, Cold Cutters, we've had our sort of moments in the sun, and this was by the mid 90s. People had sort of forgotten about us, moved on to the next thing. House, McDance, Rain Supreme, no one really cared about us anymore. When the guy from Journeys by DJ um, phoned up and said, do you want to do this? I was like, right, I'll show these motherfuckers that we're still a force to be reckoned with. And it was like, that was the motivation behind it. Let's have some some fun here. Let's show what can actually be achieved because all the, the all this other stuff, these mixes that are out there, they're crap. They're not pushing anything forward. There's, I can't hear anything there. Let's do it properly. Have you checked out um, Two Hours of Sanity? Uh, yes, I was gonna. Well, it's it's intriguingly titled part one, so that was yes, yes. Well. <laughs> did you like it? I did. Yeah, it was very different to what I'm used to from yeah. you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I you know, for years we was like, aren't you going to do Journeys by DJ part two? And it's like, no, we made the definitive statement on that. We don't know what to do to follow it up, right? Basically. And then we eventually sort of started work on stuff and two hours of sanity is what came out. And so I was more into doing something musicianly and more ambient rather than something banging. But I think it's a masterpiece, but um, it hasn't been so widely acclaimed. And I can see why, um, you know, partly because the landscape is so much more populated nowadays. But if you look at how it's constructed, it's pretty multi-threaded. Um, and I spent a lot of time on it. Um, yeah, Honestly, I got. I'm not. I'm just like being totally honest with everything I tell you. I don't listen to mixes. I don't. I don't listen to mixes. I haven't got time. Like, here's an example. People go on about vinyl and the resurgence in vinyl and the vinyl DJ and so on. Yeah, I love vinyl. I've given my collection to a friend of mine because I don't didn't use it. I can do more on my phone with my app than I can do on two turntables. And I'm into that. I can do a fuck of a lot on my app. You know, I can really twist stuff out, and I enjoy doing it. And I. I used to enjoy scratching and mixing, but I've, I've moved on. Um, that doesn't, doesn't really answer. Occasionally I hear something and I think, wow, this is really fucking great. So occasionally something will lance through the kind of fug which I'm in and which I submit to extent we're all in due to the sheer abundance over a super abundance of, of everything actually. Um, so the other day I heard James Zhu release on Brain Feeder. And this guy James Zhu released a record on Brain Feeder and he's like a, you know, a tweaker and Brain Feeder guy, but somehow he got into bed with the Metropole Orchestra from Amsterdam and started Amsterdam Dance Event last year with a live session with this orchestra. It's really off the hook. It's like the wildest thing I've heard because his stuff was quite willful, but when that willfulness is then interpreted by the orchestra and the top, top players and with a leader who really knows what he's doing, that bursts through. It's like, I haven't heard anything as wild as this for a long time. Already at that time, John and I were not much involved in, in running the label, yeah? Big Dada was started as a project by Will Ashen. So credit to Will for kickstarting that off and Ninja he saying okay we can do this and John and I thought it was great as well I do remember buying um, copies as I sometimes I get an enthusiasm for a book and then I buy copies for everyone I know the book was Upski Bomb the Suburbs and uh, I did give out copies to everyone at Ninja Tune because I thought the message was really important and part of the message was like we had a primarily white male staff at that time actually 
It's like, I am a white male myself. And it's like, well, it, you know, if you're making a living from hip hop based music, right, you need to pay some respect to black, blackness, and black culture. And actually, you need to support that in a, in a real practical way. So, by starting a label to support that kind of music from the UK, we thought it was a, a, a valid statement and a, a, a part of that drive to, to do something and not just, just take it. Um, and you know, there's a lot of talent in the UK, and you can roots maneuver perhaps certainly one of the first people to provide the hip hop consciousness of the UK with an authentic original voice that wasn't just a pale imitation of our American brothers and sisters. So, um, yeah, I, I love him as a poet and an, an icon. You know, I do think it's it's worth making the point that it, it's a it's a bit too easy for white people sometimes to be successful and exploit culturally, and uh, one's got to watch out for that. Anyway, um, you know, Rodney is uh, a, an original and a true poet. I love him. As well. Again, coming from the hip hop room, see with Ninja Tune, I think it, it, it's, it's possibly less true now, but certainly for a long time. The common interest in Ninja Tune was hip hop. It wasn't really about house and techno and, and even jungle. We liked all those things. We got them. And we wanted to mix them. But hip hop was the kind of the table that we were founded on. And I always think with hip hop because you've got you've got graffiti, so you've got art. You've got beatboxing. You've got MCing, so you've got the voice. Then you've got DJing as well. And then you've got break dancing and popping. So you've got dance. So you know you've got really strong cultural play platform there that there's a lot of multiple ways for people to get involved and i've always loved that about it so um you know, and that that's a big part of the success of ninja tune i think is because we fell in love with it at the right time and then as it sort of grew you can still trace it back to that common root we got to get them straight Yeah. Cold Cut Revolution was intended as a comment that politicians seem to be just trying to publicise themselves and market themselves like pop stars. All they care about is their ratings rather than actually getting the job done. And uh, I think that's that comment is still true today. And when you look at the, the huge mess which we're in at the moment, I think um, too much focus on what people think of you and your and your ratings, and not enough focus on on being intelligent and providing leadership. Well, I was supporting Extinction Rebellion uh, a couple of weeks ago. I played the first set on the Pink Boat at Oxford Circus, and Ninja Tune paid for that sound system, actually. And in fact, Pete, who I was mentioning before, has been getting quite stuck in with XR and providing some much needed, uh, you know, solid, clear thinking. And, and um, you know, I think that's a fantastic movement. For all its flaws, you know, at least something is happening. And, you know, you can slag it off in a million ways, but at least there's some energy there that's providing some kind of change. I think um, with David Attenborough's Climate Facts documentary, with Greta Thunberg, that wonderful Swedish girl who's been, you know, getting stuck in and people are forcing people to listen, and the Extinction um, Rebellion, we've seen a little shift, and which could be the start of what we need to save the planet and avoid going down the toilet. So that's my main kind of revolution I'm into at the moment. You know, I thought Kadra, Mohabbat Walla, which was the Bollywood track after the last album, was a pretty slamming tune. And Adrian Sherwood, who we've become, I spoke to him, um, I, oh, I'm getting him to do a remix of our, our new stuff, actually. He says that's the track from the album that he always plays out and it always gets a great response, the sort of yeah, dub mix of that. Um, I'm really happy with that track. And I said, I think it's a hit. And the, my guys at Ninja said, well, Matt, what do you mean by a hit? And I said, I think I mean a record that cool people will like for a long time. And uh, you know, 
know, it's not necessarily that it's going to be in the charts this week or, or whatever, but that's what I mean by it. It's something that people like for a long time. Because I, that, I know those tunes for me, and that's what I'm trying to achieve here. And um, I just got a, uh, I want to plug our new project, which is called oh, yeah. Killer Ketley. The collaboration with uh, a bunch of musicians from, mainly from South Africa. Okay. And done with a charity called In Place of War, who took us over generously to South Africa. Um, and uh, we recorded a new bunch, bunch of new material with these musicians. Is this going to be an album or? Yep, it's yep. looking good. So we came back, wasn't weren't quite it, sure what it, to we, do with it. Is we, you and John? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so John was there with me in Soweto and um, yeah, we jammed it, met these guys, went to the crew of, of musicians, went to the studio, had a great time, recorded a bunch of stuff and uh, came back and then we were deciding what to do with it. So we've, we've got Tony Allen on four tracks. Cool, okay. As you uh, do. We've got Dele Sosime, who's Fela Kuti's keyboard player. Fucking great. No, that was wicked. So my best friend, his son's called Miles James, and Miles has become a wicked young guitarist, um, a musician. So I got him into play some guitar. It's the first time we collaborated, even though we've known each other. He's in the Stop This Crazy Thing video when he was six months old. Uh, and uh, now he's, he's 34 or whatever. Um, so he came and played guitar on several tracks. Absolutely brilliant. I said, I need a keyboard player. He said, well, what about uh, Dele Sassina? He fell as old keyboard player, he lives in Hackney. So I literally picked up the phone, spoke to Dele, got him down to the studio the next day. What a pleasure. That like, guy played his ass off and it's some hot shit there. Coming soon. There is a musical family and there's a musical resistance family that uh, for whatever reason have not sort of been totally bought out and Hopefully we'll, we'll keep up and, and not surrender. <laughs>